wonderful thing is that we now know from experience and from science that, that we can teach people, we can help people and support people to, to achieve this state of joyous practice. Uh, even if you're a health professional who's really feeling pretty tired and burnt out at the moment, uh, this is a change that can occur in just a matter of months. I'd like to tell you a story that really illustrates how this might happen. Mary is a senior clinical leader in a hospital I once worked. It was a pretty busy and stressed hospital. She saw me by chance one day and rushed up and touched my arm and with some animation said, Robin, Robin, there's something I've really got to tell you. And this is what she said. A month or two before she'd been referred an elderly patient on a medical ward. This was a patient 78 years old with multiple medical problems, had been on the ward for two weeks with heart failure and angina, really not making much progress. And she'd been asked to come and visit her on the ward and do a specialist assessment. So she came and sat at the patient's bedside and began to ask her questions. And then she said that she noticed that the patient was quite agitated. So she stopped what she was doing and put down her notes and said, I can see you're looking worried about something. You know, are you able to tell me what the problem is? And this little old lady said um, that, that every day that she had asked to use the phone because she was very worried about some circumstance at home. And she'd asked the staff nurse, please can I use the cordless phone? And was told, no, that's not for patients. That's just for the staff. You have to use the, the patient phone. That's the card phone down the corridor. And she said, but I don't know how to use that. And I'm, I'm nearly blind and you know, I have arthritis and I can't get to it. And, and I've asked every day since I've been in the hospital and every day they've told me I'm not allowed to use the phone and I'm really worried and I don't know if my dog is being fed or something else. So this triggered off a memory for Mary. We'd done a workshop together which was about simple acts of kindness and compassion and at that moment she decided to act and she said, do you have a few minutes to wait? She dashed off the ward, took the lift downstairs, went to the hospital shop, bought a $10 phone card with her own money, came back up to the ward again and then led this old patient to the phone and helped her make the connection. Um, this old patient, she cried. This was the first time in two weeks that someone had just listened to what was really important to her. So we did all that, it took about 10 minutes, so we went back to the bed space and then Mary went back to her real job. And as Mary told me the story, she said that she finished a busy day and went home and she thought about that one instance and realised that she derived more satisfaction from that one small act of kindness than anything she'd done for a long time. And she talked, to, she talked to her husband about it. And by the time she came to work the next day, she had reconceptualised herself as a health professional. And she decided that she would be a caring human being first and an expert second. And that every day she would look for some small opportunity for, for an act of kindness and she'd been following that practice and that, that had been happening for a month or two. And she told me this story with you know, her face animated and her eye shining and she said, Robin, it's like I have a new job. And she was still working in exactly the same place in the stressed environment in the same role, but she had, just, she had been transformed. What are the steps an individual health professional can take to achieve this new state of flourishing and positivity and reconnect into the heart of their practice? I think there are five different steps. The first step is strengthening the heart. What our experience shows, and this is backed up by the positive psychology and the neuroscience, is that if in a very deliberate way we attend to simple tasks of kindness, of gratitude and appreciation, then that does something very special for our heart and brings us a lot more joy and positivity in our work. The second step is that we need to make a really positive choice to love our work. Aspects of our daily practice that really can bring us great joy and satisfaction, um, but we need to choose an attitude and we need to displace all those thoughts about how miserable I am and how fed I am and, and really make a choice about the attitude that we bring to work. That really makes a difference. And you also find that it powerfully changes the, the place around you. It, it really, when you choose a positive attitude, the whole world around you starts to become more positive as well. The third thing that people can do is that there are some very distinct skills to be learned. We work in a very pressured and very busy environment. We only have two or three minutes to build trust with the patient. There are some skills that we can help you to learn that allow you to quickly make a connection, to build that trust, 
to have a sense of rapport, to make an emotional connection. And you know, if a little bit of time is invested up front, it saves a whole pile of time later on. And the people who are skilled at this, they always find time to care. The fourth thing you can do is find ways to really liberate yourself, liberate your true compassionate self from the restrictions of the system. We work in a system that has so many regulations, so many things that govern our practice. But there are some really smart things that we can do that really allow our compassionate self to rise above the limitations of the system. Uh, one example of that is just simply to volunteer your time. Instead of going home at the end of a shift feeling really kind of pissed off and tired and, and you know, rather uh, fed up, um, you might choose instead to, to stay behind for 20 minutes and just go back to see that patient that you were concerned about and sit quietly at the bedside and hold a hand and really talk and listen to that patient. And it's so liberating when you suddenly, because you're not in your own work time, you're not subject to any of the rules and regulations, no one can tell you what to do, but you, you bring your heart to the patient's bedside and you, give some, you spend some time that really gives you deep satisfaction and meaning and then you go home with a much better feeling in your heart. We would like to explore ways of improving the humanity of our care, our strengthening care and compassion, new ways to teach our students, new ways to, to care for patients. And these communities of practice will begin to change the norm of care. And they'll publish their work and speak at conferences and begin to share it with others. Yeah.